Welcome everyone. We're just going to get started in a second, giving time for everyone to be let in from the waiting room and getting audio connected. It seems like we've reached at least a uh, critical mass for now of people. So welcome everyone to the great question session. I'm just going to give a quick introduction and uh, we'll get started. Uh, so your hosts for today are Annalise Berdini, Joe Carano, Farrell, and Valencia Johnson, your code of conduct monitor is Elena Colon Marrero, and the tech liaison is Brandon Locke and Eric Martin, I believe. I think the name might have been cut off. A couple of reminders this session is governed by the code of conduct, which you can find at that link. Uh, we also have a Code of Conduct Monitor, as I mentioned, Elena, um, you could get in touch with as well. Uh, another thing to remember is the BCC Community Agreement. One person speaks at a time. Everyone has something to contribute. Aim for more equitable participation. Please feel comfortable participating, even if you're unsure about terminology, et cetera. Beware and considerate of time embrace curiosity, and acknowledge the difference between impact and intent. Um, a couple of instructions about how the great question session might work if you are unfamiliar. Um, basically, ask a question. It's pretty simple. These could be questions related to workflows, policies, things you're struggling with, or something you'd like some community advice or guidance about. Um, you can submit your questions by using this form, and you can submit a question with your name or not. Um, so that's tinyurl.com slash askbcc. Um, it's not case sensitive, so don't worry about that. And we sort the questions that come in based on progressive stacking. And that's just a method for giving marginalized groups a greater chance to speak. Um, we won't be showing this information in the public view, and we'll delete the information after this event. Um, and once the questions come in, you can see the questions at tinyurl.com slash great q and uh, We'll also be sharing that URL on our screens. Um, and any questions you see that you have an answer to, you can go to tinyurl.com slash answer BCC, or you could enter your answers in the Zoom chat, or if you prefer to uh, answer by audio, you can raise your, use the raise hand feature in Zoom and we'll call on you and you can answer that way. Um, so an overview, we'll have the questions on screen. You can ask your question at the link below, and you can also answer questions at answer BCC. And thanks for coming. I'll hand it over to our uh, presenters today.
Thanks, Joe. I'm just going to share my screen, which might take just a moment. All right. Can people see that okay? I'm going to take that as a yes. Um, all right. So let's start. I'm going to do one refresh to get us going. In. All right, we're going to start with this question. What exactly is digital curation? and How does it relate to digital archives and digital preservation? I took a digital curation course that never actually defined the term, and it seems like it's an allied discipline with DigiPres and DigiArc, but people are talking about digital curation, I'm sorry, but people talking about digital curation are usually focused on different things. And I see one answer already. We see digital curation as a full digital curation life cycle. Preservation and curation are parts of this life cycle, can be defined as the active management and appraisal of digital information over its entire life cycle, and um, a link to uh, a website from the UK. Um, yeah, and giving folks a few minutes in chat to respond. Hey, I think I agree with, with both Jess and, and Brian's um, responses. Is there a definition of it on, oh, sorry. Uh, go ahead, Jess. Thank you. Um, is there a definition of it on the like SAA dictionary, I wonder? Um, and if not, should there be one? A kind of follow-up question to that, I guess. That was a great question. I, I haven't memorized the SAA uh, glossary. <laughs> but yes, Hannah in the chat lets us know that there is. I'm gonna do a refresh to see if we have any other answers having submitted. Nothing on screen. Let me um, let me try to. I have a, a, a chat that the text is a little small, so I'm going to try and, and reshare with a different view. Um, if you'll give me just a moment. Is that better for people? Yes, okay. I was using an external monitor that probably had too high of a resolution and not optimal resolution. Um, seeing in the chat uh, a couple other links to um, digital stewardship and other definitions. Um, so, And I, I like Lara's comment as well. I feel like these terms are not used very rigorously and don't necessarily have widely accepted definitions and clearly differentiate from, from each other. That's worth noting as well. I'm gonna move on. And... Does anyone have recommendations for courses, training, and other programs for someone new to digital preservation, particularly technical trainings on some of the tools? Nothing in the Q&A piece yet.
Jess uh, offers in the chat that she has not done this program, but there are, uh, has heard good things about the Digital Preservation Coalition's Novice to Know How program. Um, Hillary uh, chats a, a link to some trainings from the Digital Preservation Coalition. Um, I've also heard good things from that. I, I've not taken those myself. Other ideas? Give this one a refresh. Uh, Laura in the chat says digital POWRR, Digital Power Institute, also seconded by Catherine. Yeah, so SAA offers digital archives uh, specialist courses, um, which has been going on for a number of years now. Um, uh, and, and they, they do range. I've, I've heard good things about individual courses, but I can't speak to the overall curriculum. Um, and, uh, Joe chats, uh, the bigcreator.edu project, which was a grant funded initiative, um, did create some learning modules or some, some areas of, of, of learning. Um, and Hannah chats, uh, the DPOE has a list of upcoming trainings so that, that will make it into the, um, Airtable record as well. Another uh, plug for the Digital Power Institute. So there look like some great opportunities uh, here. Um, just another moment and we will move. Oh, and Alice has raised her hand. Alice, do you want to go ahead? Yeah. Um, a lot of great resources, uh, especially the um, Digital Power Institute, the digital forensics courses through SAA. I want to note that something as a new to digital preservation, when coming into it new, um, these trainings were frequently a struggle for me unless I had uh, real world examples to bring it back to in my position. So starting off with identifying what tools I specifically need to learn about and then dig into those um, more broadly, the the more context specific examples you can bring in, even to the more overall courses, uh, I found the more effective that training is going to be later on. Thank you, Alice. That is really that is really great advice. Um, I think that can apply to almost any training, to be honest, uh, not just around this uh, kind of field of work. Give this. One more refresh to see if other things. Um, another thing in the chat uh, that re regarding the SAA Digital Archives uh, courses, um, I think those full day work from Kim, uh, full day workshops were great, whether remote or in person, but the pre-recorded webinars less so. I think that's that's useful. Ari Smith, the DP workshop tutorial, uh, which Ari, if you can chat a link to that, that would be great. I don't, I don't, um, unless that's Googleable. Um, is, a, is a good basic overall course to work through. All right, let's move on to number three. Um, let's start with this one. What level of arrangement and description does your average born digital collection receive? Do you leave things in original order and rely on full text search for access, or do you rearrange the directory structures? If you rearrange, how do you document your interventions? This is a great question. Nothing in um, the Q&A form so far. People are chatting or thinking of their answers to that. Um, another plug for a uh, SAA course specifically on EPATH. Um, and then Kari also chatted the link to the DP workshop. Um, Emily has her hand raised. Oh, I'm sorry. Emily, if you want to go ahead. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I just didn't want to type. So I just thought I would <laughs> answer this question uh, on audio. For, uh, for, for me, how I kind of deal with this, it kind of depends. 
I'll use the example of you know files coming in on a USB thumb drive. Um, and it kind of depends if there are textual records associated um, with with the collection. Like, and in that case, if sort of some of the top level folders um, relate to some of the series of the textual records, then we'll I'll kind of um, mimic that arrangement and um, ar arrange the top level folders into series folders. Um, but if there is no sort of textual records um, associated, it's purely born digital. Um, then it kind of yeah it kind of depends on the 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 uh, if there are top level level folders that could be distinct series or if they're just purely um, folders and then you can kind of describe the top level folder uh, or not um, and then I guess and then I usually make a note to say like the donors top folder structure was maintained or you know they were rearranged into series to mimic the textual records uh, by the archivist. Um, so that's a long answer, but that's how I kind of have been dealing with things lately. That's great, thank you. Um, something in the forum, uh, typically leave the organization, but use intellectual arrangement in the finding aid. That's a great answer. Um, another one from the chat, so far leaving things in original order, but haven't yet had a collection that was super disorganized. Um, Bridget, uh, Sort of plus one plus ones. What Emily uh, just said uh, captures the file structure as that com that has come in, but depends on whether it looks intentional or whether it was dumped on a, a USB randomly. Also in chat, we usually leave file structures mostly as is, unless something is wonky. It's a wonderfully technical term that I often use, um, and then we generate a file listing and use that as the description. If there are physical records in the collection, we sometimes intellectually enter file. Sometimes we make separate series. It depends, and I'm not sure we figured out the best way yet. Another chat, we try to leave things in their original order as much as we can to retain context and also minimize the work in an MPLP approach. But sometimes that's more, more product, less processing, uh, if you're not familiar, approach. But sometimes for better researcher access, it makes sense to rearrange them. We document everything in a processing plan. There is a section for existing arrangement and then final arrangement, and those get saved. We also note the finding in the finding aid if we change the arrangement. Uh, Diane has a, a, a question. Mm -hmm. Does anyone make use of symlinks to provide multiple arrangements? Um, I, I, I don't. Um, I'm curious what others do. Let people ruminate on that for a moment. Uh, uh, another chat, it depends on the type of content in the collection, anything with video or audio files, those were arranged at the item level because of the one-to-one -one link they have in Kaltura, which I assume is their um, system for serving up content. The rest of the materials go into DSpace where, they're also, where it also needs a one-to-one -one match, but it can be at the folder level. Uh, there's an unknown storage size limit, and if we hit that, we need to change the arrangement. We need to rearrange, that will be noted in the funky name. And Jess, uh, rightfully points out this question really highlights the difficulties of fitting more digital materials into finding aid structures for delivery. Thanks, Elena, for contextualizing DSpace and Kaltura are both access platforms. From the form, we have some answers. I don't think these have been said yet. For DP, we refer to preferred at, that at least the file names not change, especially born digital on media like CDs. DVDs are often interdependent. At one institution, the folder structure was flattened and rendered many interdependent files useless. That's a great point. Some of these are repeating. Uh, we try to follow the same principles as with analog materials, describing the digital materials at the level of granularity that makes the most sense for good description and discovery practices. We also provide a file list. We leave an original order. Anyone can manipulate the file list. It doesn't seem needed to change the structure. For our institution, it depends entirely on the type of collection. For example, photographs that are stored on physical media unarranged will be intellectually organized based on the context of the photos themselves. However, if the directory structure was created by the donor with meaningful names, that is kept intact and reflected in the finding aid. If any changes are made, they are noted in the collection level in, the respect, in its respective finding aid. Um, note about not rearranging, if lack of time, and haven't had an encounter a collection that would benefit from it. Um, 
Most of the collections are removal media that have already been described in the finding aid based on what the processing archivist knew about the materials at the time. So generally the digital archivist makes a file tree available to researchers who ask and update any finding aid descriptions of the physical items if the processing archivist description was incorrect or learned new information. Um, always depends, sad face. Um, we try to leave things in original order, but if files are all over the place, we'll rearrange and mention in the processing notes. Um, we've also used the document desktop download top folder if files are coming from a computer um, and a Google Sheet manifest. Oh, I've clicked off of that. Um, uh, I've lost the question now. Um, oh, there it is. I think, um, so I think as Jess mentioned, there's there's a, a whole range of uh, answers and a lot of these are, it depends. Um, so I think we can keep answers coming in, but I, I think in the interest of time, I'd, I'd like to move on. Um, and I'm gonna hand off to Valencia now and do one refresh to see if new questions have come in. And I will load the next question that has not been asked. Which I believe we are here now. How can I convince my tech, my tech folks that I need a full install of BitCreator rather than only running via a virtual machine? They seem to think there are security issues with having a Linux setup. I'm at a university. It looks like we have some answers. Um, are there other departments or faculty running Linux? Example, computer science, anyone working with big data, et cetera, talking to them and their IT could provide precedent and give an example for your IT. If all else fails, get your top bosses involved. Uh, not an answer, just wanted to say I feel your pain and I have the same problem. No answer, just simply <laughs> from another uh, virtual machine user in a Windows only institution. Uh, we have the same issue. Our library IT advocated for our university, OIT, Office of um, Information, whatever, um, on our behalf as we explained the issues we were having with the virtual machine and had to find a workaround to make it compliant with OIT. To be honest, I'm not totally sure what they did. I'm just grateful they accepted the computer when it was dropped off, but feel free to email me and I can get the exact details from IT of how they made it work and the university compliance concerned. And they gave their, it's katherine.slover at uta.edu. And I see I'm not the only one having this issues. Maybe we can gather some talking points from users with the full installation that we can use to advocate for what we need. It's a bit childish, but sometimes saying, but X institutions using it is enough to get a conversation going, at least where I'm at. And let's see, in the little chatty chat, um, Diane said maybe you can make a list of what you can't do when it's in the VM, and Bridget is echoing the feelings of pain. Lena says, our university IT does not allow Linux set up on university machines because of security concerns. We were able to convince them to let us do, do this by decommissioning a computer and promising to never mount it to university servers. If we need the internet for updates, we will use a guest network via internet. Hey, I think we're ready for the other question. <laughs> How do folks pronounce AIP as ape or as it to rhyme with sip and dip? And the answers are ape, 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 smiley face. Ah! saying it in, in reference to an AIP ape going against all that is holy. We have some strong opinions. <laughs> Kim say it does bother me that it's different though. How much do you stress about preserving file system metadata? I'm working with a vendor whose DP solution 
doesn't keep any created or modified dates for ingest files, either in the file system, new, MD fields, or report, unless they, they're in the embedded MD. I hate it, but it's not always possible to capture that info separately, especially if donors are submitting their own files. And it seems we have a meeting answer. I stressed a lot about this. I pushed our vendor to improve this for us. It took a while, but eventually it was resolved. Asking to zip content up is a good general solution. If they can't be preserved, maybe asking for a report which includes date stamps before sending. Um, Farrell says sometimes the best we can do is the best we can do. Ain't that the truth? <laughs> Brian, yes, embrace loss. Just has her hand raised. Yeah, I guess I wonder if like an underlying question here is like how are people preserving file system metadata um, yeah, I don't know. I guess like, what are people doing before we've, we've had this conversation many times. We probably have other questions around it, but like, what are people doing with donors in order to get that metadata is kind of an underlying question here. It seems like, so I just thought I'd bring that up in case people have any comments towards uh, that, that might help this question after. Yeah, that's an excellent point, working with the donors beforehand. Uh, Diane said, uh, just note that these dates reflect the data transfer. Elena says, we try our best and attempt to document as much as we can when we can. And then Annalise says, zips are usually the best we can do with donors, but it helps a lot. Yeah. And then I'm raising my hand virtually, um, working with uh, curators uh, has sometimes proved to be like talking to a brick wall to get them to understand that these are important dates when we're archiving. So trying to make sure information is available directly to the donor through websites has also been very helpful in keeping those date fields. Um, Elena says, I don't even consider metadata when talking with donors because most of my time is just getting them to feel comfortable with transferring their materials. It, yeah, I feel that. Oh, and then I miss Diane. Um, I mean, what if it's re reframed as not a loss, just document how the transfer took place and what the date means. And Laura, programs like TerraCopy are free and user-friendly and could maybe be used by some donors to move files to transfer media. And Vicente, I typically communicate with donors and send them a spreadsheet to try to get them to capture as much metadata as possible for their materials before they're sent back to us. This isn't always possible, but much appreciate it when they're willing to do it. And Mary said, and if those zips are going into backlog, make sure you test them first. And oh, ah. <laughs> uh, Diane said, I mean, oh, just responded to Diane. Loss of context for sure, though, seems like it can be difficult to easily process and describe that accurate dates. However, you can determine circuit dates by the software you use, etc. So it's not that different from processing undated physical material. And James says, How much of our concern over this is inherent from digital forensic practices to have? withstands scrutiny in court. Obviously, metadata is good, but dot, dot, dot. Okay, that's everything from the chat. And I guess James is a new question. Yeah, James, I, I encourage you to submit it via the Ask BCC. <laughs> <laughs> Um, let me do Link one more refresh to see if anything okay. else.
internet connection is a little slower than I anticipated. Uh, these are all things that came from the chatty chat. All right. So refresh to see if anything new has come in. And not seeing anything on the scroll back. At what point do you give up on figuring out how to open an obscure file? Do you evaluate how important the file might be? Contact the donor, put in a figure, let's say put it, put it in and figure, and put it in a figure out later pile, cry. While people think about it, I, I my, my evergreen answer is it depends, I guess. Um, probably depends on the, the collection how much of a priority it might be to our staff. Uh, Kim says all of the above in the chat. I, uh, sort of, I, this is something I struggle with, how much time to devote to troubleshoot. All of the above, Tracy also seconds. Um, Diane, do you, do you wanna add a little bit more context about what Strings does? Sure, I'm happy to. Um... It's basically another one of my break glass in case of emergency tools. It just outputs any printable string it could find in a binary bit of stuff. And sometimes it gives you a little bit of a hint about what this thing is or where it came from. Um, and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it gives you nothing you can use. But I think that sometimes you can get something out of it and it points you in a direction or it tells you like, okay, it's time to give up. Brian also says to embrace loss here. <laughs> uh, Laura, uh, anyone who is on the BitCurator user group, uh, maybe have seen her email about uh, picked files, PICT files. It's exhibit A is uh, how far she goes to open uh, or convert them. Uh, Amy, not, not so much cry as it uh, sounds. Um, Elena, I consider how much time I have to generally, de generally to devote to it. Honestly, I don't have a lot of time. That's an evergreen statement. If the processing archivist really needs to know the context, then I will devote more time to it. However, if the processing archivists don't really need to know more for description, then we will put it in the on the up, uh, put it put the onus on the researcher to figure it out. Michael Hex editor is a second uh, great stop uh, after Droid. Sometimes there is something human readable. I will second that. I often use a hex editor when I have a. Uh, Odd looking bitstream. Refresh this to see if anything else came through that's not a chat, but I, I think these are some good. Oh, I feel so seen with this question. That is that is one I think we can all identify with. All right, I'm going to move on to the next one. I was not familiar with strings, so that's one that I'm going to add to my kind of work. I work on the corporate side of a university, and I mostly work in the cloud and manually create the files in a spreadsheet report. It sounds like everyone is working with tools on their local computers. This information I am archiving is pulled from behind a login system. So I que so I question do I re so my question is do I recreate the folder and file structure in order to use digital tools to speed up the processing and turnaround? As answers come into that, I, I would say it. it it, the the labor that goes into recreating a folder and file structure might matter if that seems important to understanding the objects, but I don't know if that would affect the speed it with with which digital tools could um, could process things. Others have notions about this one.
And I would also maybe add that if the if the spreadsheet report that you're uh, manually creating um, documents some of this organization, I don't know if creating the file structure, again, it, without knowing more about your context, um, I, I don't know if, if, if I have better answers, sorry. Anything else from the hive mind, or maybe we can return to this one if time allows. Elena in the chat, I don't think you need to recreate the folder and file structure if doing so doesn't actually speed up your process, but it would be a matter of testing to see what is a better fit for your particular context. Seconds. Seem to have stumped the hive mind with this one. <laughs> I'm going to move on to Does anyone have experience taking records from an organization who suffered a cyber attack? Any tips about how to have that conversation? Any unique stakeholders for this kind of potential records transfer? Or any words of warning wisdom would be much appreciated. But my assumption would be that unique stakeholders might involve uh, administrators in the, on the legal or IT security side that you might not otherwise have been interfacing with assuming that organization has uh, those offices. Not seeing anything in chat just yet. And I guess my assumption is also that this is um, the organization's cyber attack happened sometime in the past and that they're back up to operation. Um, that, that would seem to be a, a higher priority than transferring records to a, an archival institution. Joe says in the chat, ask about encrypted data without keys maybe for ransomware. And Amy suggests that maybe we could have a bit BCC get together related to the British Library cyber attack, which they, they've published some information about. Um, another plug for the uh, cyber incident at the British Library. Answers in the Form include what was IT's involvement and did the organization have buy-in, backup, or support for handling this? And uh, an art, a plug for it, some, someone to write up, uh, it, it, the question answer to write up what you end up doing would be very interesting. I think that, that is a great, a great response, if, uh, um, if not uh, more information. Let's, I'm going to hand back over to Valencia now, I'll refresh to see if anything new has come in. And I hope we do have one up here. I appreciate everything everyone is doing, but is the BCC planning to update the documentation? With the new version of BitPayer, I'm I am finding a lot of documentation outdated and can use some help beyond the big carrier EDU learning objects. Well, maybe this can be on a future list of some kind. 
Elena, uh, we want to, but we need more hands to help. If you'd like to volunteer your time with helping to update documentation, it would be much appreciated. Um, Shelly said the document and training committee is working on these updates. Jess said working on them to help with a link. And there's an, yeah, that's it. And Farrell said contributions may could be as lightweight as telling us um, which aspects are the highest priorities to update. So this is a great opportunity to be more involved with BCC if you if you would like to help us update documentation. And David said, we are open to new issues and pull requests and uh, provide a link to the GitHub. Um, on to the next question. Do people slash institutions maintain original optical media or floppy disks once the content has been migrated off for those disks? If yes, would love to know, maybe even just respond with yes. If not, why not? And do you have a deaccessioning policy that documents this decision? Uh, the answers um, on the form are no, because there's no value experientially for our users and using CDs. We have sufficient preservation practices and the formats are generally obsolete. The sole reason we have found to even utilize these are accessibility for older folks, depending on the thoroughness of your collection practices. Yes, mainly because we haven't decided on a policy for getting rid of the carriers. Yep, because A, we have the space. B, I'm often working with collections that have already been physically processed and described. So removing them, we need updating the finding aid and possibly rearranging the collection. C, often our removable media contains annotations, art, or other design that could be valuable to researchers. D, because we're still a little paranoid about our whole damn system might collapse and we'll have to use the media to restore what we can. No, um, we do have written policy that states in general, we do not retain original media. We retain it for a specific period and then securely destroy. Exceptions can be made on a case by case basis. And we have a yes. And going back to the chat. Sente said, our official policy is no, but I'm too weak to throw it all away. But yes, we're supposed to. The physical media has meaningful wordage, et cetera. A photo is taken in place with the assets. Elena, no, we don't have the space to keep everything. We will keep a carrier if the carrier has um, a factual value themselves. Otherwise, it gets tossed once the content is transferred off. We do not need to formally deaccession the disk because the important bit is the data, which we have elsewhere. Laura says we always photograph original media so that if there's any useful annotations, we have a record, but we do not retain the media. And then there are some updates. Reason to keep them might include original writings on the outside of the media that are worth preserving in themselves or relative rarity of the medium itself. Official policy, so that is, we read that one. No, sometimes if a floppy or carrier is cool, we might keep it. Um, doo -doo -doo. Erica said for collections with anticipated exhibition value, we have selected samples of the original media for potential display. Oh, uh, Kari says, one thing to check with your organization's technical recycling department to find out what they do with the disk. Can it be taken and the data pulled off? Who's the vendor? Do the tech recycle bits, um, 
been set out in the public areas. <laughs> and Joe likes the coolness of the appraisal metric. <laughs> Um, and Elena said, for context, they get hundreds of hundreds of pieces of removable media a year, so it's not feasible to keep. And Keith said, also good to keep in mind the records for side need, side for media. If you're determining, if you determine that certain files should not remain in your institutional archive or RM program, you should also destroy the version of the original media. Laura said, we ensure all discarded media is being secure, securely destroyed, not, not being reused or just thrown in the trash. Annalise Liz throwing media out is good for her mental health. <laughs> and then there was a follow-up uh, from Vicente as how are people destroying their physical media? So that might be a good question to put in the tiny bit link. Okay. This is back to me, Valencia. Oh. Or do you have one more? I've already I lost count. <laughs> <laughs> I think I have one more. And yeah, then I, Diane said, I only panic about it because I'm the person colleagues go to when the disk image wasn't complete and I can find the missing data. Cool. And I think we're good. If anyone has publicly available definition of transfer device and archival object, that would be awesome to share. And we have one answer um, for digital archival object from the SAA's um, dictionary. Um, Farrell says, I think this one is challenging because archive space has an archival object, which may be different from so how someone else uses archival object and conversation. Yeah, I think that I'm sorry to, to jump off mic but, or on mic. I think the answer might be like as long as you are consistent in how you use it in your um your institution and your conversations that you have, it's it's probably as as probably the best that can happen, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. I think it's back to you. All right, I'm going to do a refresh to see if anything new has come in. Sorry for the scroll motion. Does your institution's deed of gift include information related to born digital materials? And if yes, what aspects of working with this material are addressed? One answer so far, yes, we ensure that we have permissions to take any actions on the files that would be necessary for stewardship or access. For example, to copy and store them on our preservation infrastructure, to provide access to users in whatever way is our practice at the time, to include them in digital exhibits, and to remove any that we feel do not have persistent value or are not in alignment with our collection development policy. Laura says in the chat, uh, we have an addendum for e-records. You can see that here. She posts a Google Drive link, which is great. So we also have a, an, an addendum. It's not part of the standard agreement, but we add it when, when the 
that's what there is stuff. Amy uh, also says they have a, a DOG uh, addendum, collection transfer form with uh, board digital related questions and the donor interview questions uh, that nobody remembers to use. <laughs> Good times. <laughs> Yeah, Laura also says there's a questionnaire that really gets used. I, I will second that uh, questionnaire is un, un, uh, unused very regularly. Annalise, exact same issue. Katie, we desperately need to update our deed of gift to include digital records as well as archiving websites. It is complicated by the fact that our university council always has to get involved if and when we update our deed of gift. That's a good point. I just had to remind someone today that the donor needs to fill out our additional digital materials form as well. Um, we recently added a, to our, our request for web archiving form that curators fill out, whether like a checkbox be like, have you included this in the deed of gift? Um, just kind of remind them to go back to the donor if they haven't. The, the Philly satellite meeting, we have a workflow that requires that the curator ask the donor if they have digital materials. And if so, it triggers a conversation with the digital archivist or digital preservation librarian before acquisition. That is great. That's from Penn. Elena, I have opted to not have a donor filled questionnaire. Instead, I have a document for our field archivists to use when talking with donors and to include that information in their accession record. Our deed of gift is just general and provides blanket cover for materials. Uh, Brian, on the other hand, archival materials are archival materials. And as it has been argued to me, the deed covers all materials. I think we've tweaked our deed to make it more, to make it clearer, but we don't have a separate deed or addendum. Uh, at this point, I really wish we could incorporate the addendum in our regular deed of gift, especially since more and more accessions include at least some electronic records, uh, but we've gotten pushback on this. That's a good point, Laura. So yeah, a range of, of policies. Um, let's see if anything has been... Uh, someone else via the forum has said uh, they have created an agenda that they're really proud of that addresses encryption, privacy, file formats in plain language, but we have yet to get our curator to use it. Separate attachment sheet for born digital materials. Typical questions include file formats, file size, copyright restrictions, transfers, and uh, description of materials. We have a supplementary digital preservation agreement that gives donors some choice over what they want us to do. It's a menu of options, not a free choice. I think that's probably important. One more refresh here. All right, I'm gonna move on. So a range of a range of opinions or a range of practices as fields want. Scroll motion. This one. I often receive social science research data with code files, such as Python, R, SAS, or Stata, to preserve at my institution. The code is version controlled using Git or SVN, and I'm not sure what value there is to retaining the .git or .svn folder. Would that content be useful to resurrect the project later? Should I simply auto exclude Git and SVN when I see them? Are there any gotchas to think about when keeping these version control software forms? A couple answers already. Eliminating these resources could prove problematic when trying to resurrect an old project. The .git folder contains information required to reconstruct any past commit or release. One possibility is that the main branch code you've received is development code several commits ahead of the last official release, in which case you might need the data in the .git folder to, in order to rewind to, for example, a release that matches the one used in the published research or one that works at all. Uh, I second that these are very important for recon reconstruction. I wonder if there's a tool to summarize the contents 
of these versioning folders in a plain text file in case you're worried that it's too obtuse. This is something that I've not had to deal with personally. Yes, just I don't know, this is exactly what I was thinking. I'm impressed with the depth of knowledge in this answer. Thanks, Van. <laughs> I think that is that is great. We have a few more seconds to see if other uh, answer offered. I well, actually, I'm going to note to myself to talk to our research data um, consultants who, who are separate from the special collections, but this sounds like something that I'm not sure, I wanna make sure we're doing something along these lines. All right. Um, oh, and David says in the chat, softwareheritage.org may have some useful information. That's great. Advice for communicating with your non-tech savvy boss about how much work goes into processing and accessioning born digital archives and how each step is actually necessary. In other words, it's going to take weeks to work through a collection that isn't faster than a paper collection. Great question, says Tracy. <clears throat> One approach to take, I've built up my workflow as a series of tickets in the JIRA project management software. With JIRA, you can even do time tracking for each step so you can prevent some concrete info to your boss. When I have been asked to explain why processing a collection will be difficult or time consuming, I have provided a work plan with a very detailed list of tasks, along with a rough estimate of time spent. This time estimate is a pretty wild guess on my end, to be honest, but begins to communicate that the work will take days or weeks or months rather than hours. One approach might be focusing on the number and length of time tasks take rather than the technology or complexity of the task at hand, if that's not information that will move you toward your goal. Highlighting this intellectual work uh, involved that uh, work involved that may be familiar in the context of analog collections could be helpful. Appraisal, researching and crafting, historical, historical notes, etc. I would couch it in terms of how the digital processing is potentially more error prone versus physical processing by using analogies. How easy it would be for your boss to accidentally delete an email versus accidentally destroying a piece of paper correspondence. Find an example of bit rot in an image that you can show your boss for what happens when to files that drop bytes if the work isn't done properly. Again, with an analogy, a piece of paper transferred into a folder with one hand versus two, aka good handling versus bad handling. We've been using a Google form to track time for various digital accessioning and just processing tasks for several years. It has been very helpful for demonstrating how much time various tasks to take and needed resources, staffing, or equipment. And then from the chat, um, time managing myself using Toggle, which is a free um, task management tool that helps to sum up math um, and math out the amount of time things take versus the size of collections. Um, triple three plus uh, to answer about analogies is not only effective, but also doesn't involve tailorizing or tracking down a work down to the minute. Uh, time tracking and project planning works. Plus one to time tracking on processing all of your collections and be really granular. I'm sure the differences in processing transfers and media. We did this for just one year and it made a huge difference in being able to advocate for more resources when the accession optical and legacy media. Um, if it translates to budget and saving money, people are generally on board. Um, on the analogy train, finding examples, and I'll plus one that um, we, we were able to, to show um, embedded data in a PowerPoint file and how looking at, you know, not performing a, a sensitive data review step would have potentially divulged uh, FERPA information um, has, has been really helpful talking, not just to my boss, but to like upper, upper level administrators. Uh, Laura, I'm doing a presentation about our time tracking work for digital processing at the upcoming best practices exchange and also at this year's SAA, if anyone's uh, planning to attend those. Uh, Keith also plus ones the analogy suggestion. I've never spent a day troubleshooting on how to open a carton. That's a great one. So we'll give a few more moments. Yeah, time tracking. These are all from the chat. Yeah, so there, there seem to be a range of both uh, kind of um, communication tactics you can take with your, your boss, as well as um, kind of uh, statistical gathering for yourself. 
I think. How often are we running checksums? And are we doing it manually? Recommend a checksum checker with a GUI, please. Uh, some answers for files in our active workflows, uh, before and after capture transfer, after workflow actions that may alter files, for example, virus scan, and at least every 120 days at rest. Another answer, we work with a preservation vendor who stores our data on LTO tape. The vendor does integrity checks once per year. There Their answers related to checksums. I would second the active workflows, like when something is moved. Um, are there GUI checksum checkers that people can write? I think that's I use a command line. Kim in the chat says, I'm using quick hash hyphen GUI. That's a new one to me. Uh, TerraCopy has a verify function, but it's using like CRC hashes, which I, I, don't, not, I don't believe are as uh, secure as some of the other ones. Uh, Smithsonian put their tool on GitHub. They have an MD5 tool linked in the chat. These will make it into the, the Airtable card. Um, someone else has uh, put in the, the form a checksum checker with GUI. It's a SourceForge uh, web link, file verifier is the name of it. Uh, Diane would like to know more about the context of where this checksumming is happening. I think it might help determine what a good tool might be. Oh, Alice uh, corrects me. I, I was not aware of this. If you're using TerraCopy um, and create a checksum, you can click on the checksum file afterwards and TerraCopy will use that to verify. I think you can select the checksum type. So that's, we had TerraCopy came up in the session the other day as a, as a Windows, um, and maybe other platforms well, but, but Windows tool for um, copying files from place to place. Uh, Lara in the chat, uh, we have started using a checksumming program called Cores that we really like uh, because it allows you to add things to the digest without always rerunning the whole digest. And Joe suggests something called Exact File, although it hasn't been updated in a while, so that may, may not be a long-term solution. Uh, Oscar suggests that, or it says that TerraCopy doesn't work well on Mac to verify the checksum, which is a bummer. GTK hash on Linux, um, Droid will output hashes, um, Brunhilde, which is a command line. I think maybe Brunhilde has a GUI as well. We'll also run checksums. Uh, James believes Archivematica has a separate storage setup that automates the city checking. Um, they've not yet implemented it though. Mileage may vary. All right, so I hope that gives people, um, the question asker, some, some resources to check on. Um, I'm gonna hand back over to Valencia. I'm gonna do a refresh to see if new questions have come in. First. All right. All righty. Our policy in DataGIF says we do not provide access to deleted files. We recently, um, carve text files from an allocated space on a floppy disk image. Any ideas of how to know if it was deleted or not? Thoughts about seeing the file was not deleted since we can't know one way or another.
Diane said this might be one where you have to go with the spirit of the policy. It seems like is there anything in the card? Ask the donor if they're living. I think that's it. Carol, um, I think I think I would assume it was deleted unless I can prove otherwise. How are people approaching remote transfer of born digital materials that use a two-factor sign-in requirement, save from a donor's iCloud, Facebook to download data, Dropbox, the list goes on. Looking at the chat. <laughs> Judith says we haven't had to retrieve files like this yet. Um, Farrell says, I'm sure what uh, Clone's function is with multi-factor. Vicente says, our institution uses Box, which allows donors to transfer files without needing an account. Elena said, we offer our university Dropbox for transfers when we have an extremely high data limit. Oh, as they have an extremely high data limit. Otherwise, I will walk the donor through the steps of getting their materials off of iCloud, Facebook, et cetera, and transfer it to us. Amy says, most likely get a box file request and try to walk them through the export from their end, which often goes extremely awry because people know enough about their storage systems to mass produce records, but not enough to get anything out of them. I can't be feast. I think that's it for that question. Does anyone ask donors to inventory files pre-transfer on their local workstations? What tools do you recommend they use and how much support do you provide them as they inventory their files? We've done this with photo archives and it's quite time consuming on the staff side with a lot of hand holding. We have not yet done this with other types of incoming digital collections. This is the dream. <laughs> Honestly, from anecdotal um, experience with donors, the ones who are the least organized will would also not be willing to get at concerned about using a file system, using a system to inventory their files. Those who are already very organized are concerned that their files need to be perfectly arranged before sending them, which we assure them is not the case. 
Spreadsheets, emails, phone calls are usually good enough. Um, raising my hand. Oh, there's, there's Annalise. <laughs> we used to try to do this, but the lack of success had really made it uh, something we've moved away from. If we can get them to not email <laughs> files and pieces, it's a win. It's technically still within our documentation, and I once had success doing this remotely over Zoom with a donor. Alice only once so far, but I asked the donor to provide remote control via Zoom, and he allowed me to install and run Sikri. It took about an hour on Zoom, and he sent me the resulting file afterwards. Elena, no, we do not ask this of donors. It's generally too high a barrier for our donors, and my job is to make the transfer process as easy as possible for donors. Beryl, when this happens, it's usually because the donor is sending us very specific things, i.e. photographs from a specific project, rather than their manuscript collection. Elena, a few times donors have provided, oh, chat, provided us a file list. It is never accurate. Vicente, yes, we have at minimum asked donors to create some kind of directory structure with folder names. However, it's not always possible. And I think that's it. We have some people um, lamenting uh, the using emails as file transfers and piecemeal. I think we can all feel that pain. All right. Amy says, um, IME is easier and still helpful to get some information about any file management norms donors are using rather than a specific file list. Um, Yes, we have at minimum asked donors to create some sort of directory structure with folder names. However, it's not always possible. Um, and then Alina, one thing I asked about donors, um, I asked is if the donors can get all the files in one place, easier said than done. I feel that pain. <laughs> Um, Emily said, my favorite donor provided readme files to each of the top level folders he included on an external hard drive that explained their contents. He was a physics professor. Oh my goodness. What a dream. What a dream. Okay. Shall we move on to the next question? All right. Anyone have resources to share for using or most especially troubleshooting Brunilda? Current issues is indefinite hangups after running Siegfried over a 14K-ish logical file set. No errors, it just runs forever. Um, answers, no resources I know of, but it sounds like you might need more RAM CPUs. Running Sigfree by, by itself might be more effective. Clarification from the asker. I have successfully run Brunhilde on a larger file set previously. Something is something in this particular set is hanging things up just after Sigfree um, scan complete processing results. Farrell says, yeah, it sounds like 
memory can be an issue. I don't know if there's any debug option for Brahilda.python. I can hop on mic real quick. I, I know uh, uh, Tessa has been really um, responsive to tickets in the past. I'm not sure if, if they're currently able like, with their with their work setup and how, how much time they have to devote to this, but um, I mean, uh, putting an issue on the GitHub, particularly if you have um, kind of output that you can share might might be helpful. Annalise, you've probably thought of this, but are you running it with Bulk Distractor and does it have a lot of AV? When we miss big AV components, this tends to happen. Lynn, update from the asker fee. It, oh goodness, it's uh, 135,000 files, not um, 13,500. So it's likely capacity, but it would, but we still have more documentation, so I think it's a plus one to the card about bit curator documentation. That's a lot of files. All right, thank you for the updates, Lynn. back over um, EPAD, my team, my IT team is asking me how other institutes, institutions are setting this up on their network. Any advice? The team is particularly concerned about security. The answer is in the card. I believe it's a web application, which makes it less sketchy than downloading a program on the computer. We have a dedicated workstation for it too, so it can be monitored more easily. Maybe also cite that numerous other institutions use it. I think on the EPAD website even they give examples. Another answer, EPAD is a browser-based application, but by default, the data that you import into it is stored on your local hard drive. This gives you control over the security of the data. You can encrypt the hard drive, store the workstation in a secure or restricted location, et cetera. You can even run EPAD on a non-networked workstation, and EPAD does not require an internet connection except for the discovery module, which runs on the web server. Those are two great answers. Are there other EPAD using folks that want to weigh in? Lena in the chat, we have the executable file on our local hard drive of a non-networked workstation and use it from there. I think that is a, yep, same plus one from Emily. Okay. Um, refresh once, but I hope that answers or at least provides some place for this question asker to go next. For those who use both BitCurator and a forensic recovery of this device or FRED, how do you use both in your workflow? For example, do you use FRED primarily for imaging and BitCurator for reporting? Answer in the card. Interesting question. We have not been able to get BitCurator Suite to install properly on our FRED using a VM. If we assign more than one processor core, as we are instructed to assign at least two, it won't boot up. So we only use BitCurator on an older workstation. And I'm curious if others using a FRED have had any difficulties. We are not FRED users at my institution. Are there other thoughts in chat or? I can jump in. 
Um, we use Fred um, and it's running an older version of BitCurator. Um, but, and correct me if I'm wrong, we've moved away um, from, we moved to just using co command lines and we actually moved towards using a virtual machine because we had problems with our Fred. Um, and I know that my digital archivist wants to set it on fire. So <laughs> yeah, I can <laughs> jump in and clarify. So yeah, we have two Freds that have BitCurator natively installed. Um, one has updated to the current version and one hasn't. The one that hasn't updated is somewhat more effective than the one that was updated. Um, they do not work well. They have deactivated all of our USB ports other than the right blocked one. That has been the case for years. Uh, Digital Intelligence had promised folks, this was before I got here, uh, that it would work well and it, it it doesn't. So we we have moved to VMs for now, which should solve a lot of problems. That's why we're using command line tools because it's the updated version of Big Curator. Um, we have the FREDs as backup for basically like specific media accessions because uh, we have a cryoflex on one of the machines that's linked to the FRED. So, um, but otherwise we're getting rid of them as soon as possible. Yeah. Um, so we we kind of, yes, we kind of use the FREDs primarily for imaging. Um, yeah, and actually I'm seeing comments about our setup in the chat, which are accurate, so. Yeah, the um, Philly Satellite from University, University of Pennsylvania, uh, big curator for all possible things, FRED for an excellent, you know, this is external disk drive, RAID, and if uh, Windows is required, pro tip from Annalise, link the computers via KVM switch for sharing monitor, keyboard, mouse. Uh, Tori, plus one is the KVM switch. Switch. I don't have a thread, but I do have two computers in my setup, and it is great. Amy has run a recent BitCurator install on a thread, and it goes okay, but not doing a ton of disk imaging, so it may not be relevant if the question is mostly about that. Uh, Lynn, we use BitCurator on a separate workstation from Fred, uh, but for us, that's because of a different staff member who does the imaging and migration from media. The processing staff take disk images, logical sets that are pulled and use BitCurator for appraisal and review of content. Uh, Sarah plus one is the KVM use. And Laura asks, what is KVM? Keyboard, video, mouse. Diane uh, clarifies. Thanks for that, Diane. Can you see if other answers have come in? Uh, I have a dual partition Fred. This is Dylan. Uh, dual partition Fred, Windows Ubuntu, but it is a nightmare getting IT to install BitCurator and not all tools work. So I mostly just use the Windows partition. Feels like we almost have enough people that use both systems that, or have both systems in play that there could be a user group around. <laughs> right, um, mindful of time. I'm going to move to the next one. Do you think it's a good idea to use original disk images as space-saving basis for layered file systems, such as those used by Docker and deployment as well? Each tier could model an access level from employee only to public with fewer and fewer files visible. Um, one answer so far is, uh, I think there was a clarification, they meant uh, provisioning instead of deployment. Um, I, I don't have an answer for this one. <laughs> it also sounds like this could uh, use more experimentation, I think, uh, to, to see how it would function in practice. This is, I think, the first time I've been actually thought about this. If there's any other thoughts in chat?
Yeah, not seen anything. Um, I would say that the question asker, uh, should they have the time, do some experimentation and maybe it's a presentation at an upcoming forum. <laughs> Building a proposal for obtaining BitCurator to submit to the IT review committee at my academic institution. Would anyone be willing to share tips and tricks? Are there models for proposals out there? Jess, you have your hand raised. Yeah, the BitCreator talking points that I think Kari shared earlier in the chat. Do you have like talking points for um, talking to IT? And so I wonder if there might be anything there that might help this question asker. Yeah, I would. I would also look to um, if there are examples of where examples exist at your academic institution of users using Linux endpoints um, and, and um, seeing if there are similarities to what those users are doing and what, and what you would want to be doing with BitCurator. Do a, a refresh. I think we have time for, for one more. So I'm going to, to do this one and then I think we'll probably have to move into wrap up. I have struggled with Windows inadvertently changing the last modified dates of our files in ways we don't expect, such as when opening but not editing images using Windows Photo Viewer. We have seen the last modification date change even when the team member viewing the files has read-only access. Are there strategies for working with Windows to ensure this doesn't happen, such as settings we can change? Um, one answer is I always use Earphone View. I may be mispronouncing that name. Uh, for image opening in Windows, it's much faster and has never caused me problems like this. Also great for batch operations on images. I would maybe add that whatever you can document before touching the files really with your, with your as a user would be useful. Um, even if those dates then are changed on the objects themselves, you have the documentation you generated. Uh, Jess plus one's earphone view. Other answers in these last moments? Uh, Michael says using this tool as well, but only if I only need to view a sampling, I'll simply copy a subset and view those. That's a that's a great idea. Copying, you know, the set that you need to manipulate, you know, this is an issue would be a good a good strategy. Okay, um, I think we're about at time. Yeah, uh, one more from chat. Your from view is our default image program on both of the workstations, and I make sure it's set on our processing archivist laptops. But our processing archivists only look at a copy of the materials and not the originals. That's another good point, kind of piggybacking off Michael's idea. So I hope that, that gives you some answers, question answer. Um, I, I think this concludes the great question uh, session for, for today. Um, are there some housekeeping wrap-up steps from uh, Jess or the other big curator folks?